Today, I'm going to review the best accessories for each commander in Rise of Kingdoms, whether you're in the end game or you're in the early game and thinking about what you might one day want to make. This video will help you understand the role of every single accessory in Rise of Kingdoms. And if you're into equipment, let me tell you about the sponsor of today's video, which I think has a very fun equipment system. Today's video was sponsored by War and Order, a city building war game that has a really awesome equipment system. There's two reasons that I like it. The first thing that I like is that if you're crafting in this game and you know what you're doing, you can dramatically increase your chances of getting legendary gear, which is why I have all legendary quality equipment on my lord. But the other thing I really like is that you can enhance each piece of equipment with a special effect. So for example, I really wanted to smash opposing enemy infantry. And so I have an effect on here that increases my damage against infantry. Now there are other stats that I could use to customize differently if I wanted. For example, if I was more worried about cavalry, I could customize and do extra damage against cavalry. Each piece can be enhanced and customized in order to suit your needs. But this is really just one of many systems in War and Order that allow you to customize how hard every single one of your armies hits because these buffs and bonuses apply to literally every army that leads your city. One other area where you can do a lot of a customization, and this is similar to equipment, is something called artifacts. Artifacts apply a series of stat bonuses. My favorite is currently Athena's Aegis. If you power this particular piece of equipment up enough, you can even unlock a special shielding effect that is so amazingly powerful, shielding your army for the start of the battle. And for those of you interested in more than just equipment, there are also beasts in War and Order, and your beast can dramatically change the way that your army performs as well. Not only do the beasts have unique skills, and there are several that you can choose from, by the way. I happen to have a phoenix, but there's also the panda, the drake, and the pegacorn. It's like a unicorn, pegasus. But also, each beast has a talent tree where you can specialize the stats and bonuses in the way that they work. So there really are a lot of ways in War and Order to customize how your armies will perform. If you wanna check out the game, you can use the link in the description, which supports the channel. And it is sponsorships like this that make it possible for me to create content full time. So a big shout out to War and Order for sponsoring today's video. And please do use the link in the description to check out War and Order. Here's what we're gonna do today. I'm gonna go over every single artifact to talk about its role. And then I'm gonna go commander by commander and talk about what I think the best artifacts are going to be for those commanders. This is going to move pretty quickly to so try to avoid this being like a 30 plus minute video. So if you need to rewatch parts of it, or if you want a way more detailed explanation about each of these artifacts, I made a dedicated video that I'll remind you about at the end of this one that goes way more in depth behind the math of each of the choices I'm going to recommend to you. That video goes way in depth on things like breakpoints, rage limits, uh, the amount of people swarming a march, and so on. So with all of that said, let's get going. Starting with the legendary artifacts, the greatest glory boosts your normal attack damage. This will work in a 1v1 situation. Somebody's targeting you, you're targeting them. But it scales up for each thing that hits you. A normal attack damage is not only the damage you deal to the thing you're targeting, but it's also the damage you deal to everything targeting you. So this does scale for each army hitting you, they will all be taking the extra counterattack damage by virtue of having this on. It's strong in situations where you know you're going to get swarmed. The next artifact we've got is the Horn of Fury. You know this is one of my favorites. It has a 30% chance to generate 50 rage. That is a lot of rage and there's no internal cooldown. So this thing can fire off back to back, turn after turn, which completely pops off and is out of control. It scales on commanders that give you more rage when they generate rage. This is generally the rejuvenate talent or skills that generate rage where Horn of Fury is really, really powerful. From there, we get a look at the Concealed Dagger. This stacks a health debuff onto an enemy. 30% chance to reduce the target's health by 5%. The weirdness here is that if one person has a Talented Dagger and another person does not, the Talented Dagger will knock off the stacks of the Untalented Dagger. All that to say... The dagger is really strong. I don't think it's important that you go for a special talent on this compared to other things that you might look at. 
and it is one of the first open field fighting accessories you should make because this thing scales up in value for you based on how many people hit the same target. This is debuffing an enemy, which means everybody hitting that same enemy all benefit. So the more people hitting the same thing, the more value you're getting from your concealed dagger. I'm going to jump around on the list to actually cover, cover a very similar item here, Mora's Web. Same sort of an item. This is reducing the defense of the target. But again, it is a reduction on the target, which means it scales up in value to you based on the number of people hitting the same thing. I'm not saying the effect gets stronger when more people hit the same thing. I'm saying you get more value because each march that's hitting the same target benefits from the defense reduction. So you get a total of three stacks. That's 12% defense reduction. In addition, it reduces the march speed of cavalry. I like to put my Mora's Web on units that move very quickly so that you can apply a march speed reduction on enemy cavalry potentially. But the reason I think this is probably the second accessory that most people should shoot for is because of the fact that it scales up nicely the more marches you bring to the field. So if you have three, four, or a certainly five plus marches in the field, you get a lot of value putting debuffs from something like Mora's Web. Now from there, we're going to jump back up on the list and talk about Lucky Coin. Lucky Coin also scales in value to you, but not based on your targeting the same thing. Now it's everybody targeting you. So Lucky Coin has a 10% chance to grant you a shield. That shield effect lasts for two seconds, and it does not stack, I think, with other shields in game. So even though we know that active skills will not stack with each other and passive skills will stack with each other and passive skills will act, stack with active skills, the thing is that shields are completely different. Shields only take effect if they are the strongest shielding effect available. So if you have a commander that's already throwing out shields, for example, Alexander the Great, putting a lucky coin on there may or may not get you value if it triggers on the same turn when you were already shielded. All that to say the lucky coin is really good when lots of things are hitting you, and I think this is most ideal, probably an Ark of Osiris when you want to hold a garrison. Theoretically, it's also good in KVK if you really don't want something to burn, but I think in most cases you'd rather be dealing more damage to the enemy, and there is a 5 second internal cooldown on this effect, which means that if you're getting 12x swarmed, I mean, theoretically, that could trigger like every 5 or so seconds. However, all those seconds in between, I mean, that shield pops almost immediately with 12 things swarming you, right? So you do get a lot of shielding from it, but um, it's, it's limited to how much it can really scale because it only triggers once every 5 seconds, whereas... An item like Vengeance is purely 100% counterattack damage. Since you made it this far in the video, by the way, you may as well consider subscribing to the channel. I have over 1,700 videos dedicated to making you a better player in Rise of Kingdoms, so subscribe to get those videos in your daily feed right away. This is really strong on things you know are going to get swarmed. This is not good for just general open fielding. It's really good on a garrison, again, that you know is getting swarmed, and it's absolutely wicked on something like Pakal Herald. You're evil. You're evil for using this, and I applaud your evil genius, okay? That's where Vengeance is really strong. From there, I want to cover two accessories that are available pretty early from uh, Holy Knight's Treasure, and that's Karak Wardrums and Seth's Call. Now, Karak's Wardrums is a bit of a weird one. This is not really great for swarming a garrison, because if you're swarming a garrison... Not all your marches maybe are hitting it at the same time, which means you're putting rage onto your marches that are standing around or circling. And if all that sounds complicated to you, let me just simplify this by saying it's really just for open field. That's where this accessory shines. It puts rage onto your marches. 10% chance to generate 50 rage on three armies. That's your army plus two others. And it does prioritize your own marches. And it doesn't show up in the battle log last that I looked at this particular accessory. I think this accessory is popular for trying to skill cycle before an enemy, and it is very popular among endgame players. I don't know that I have seen proof that it is for sure better, but I know that it is very popular. From there, let's talk about the less popular cousin, the Seth's Call. This gives you a 10% chance to grant your army and to others 10% increased attack for three seconds. The problem here is that there is a diminishing return on stats in Rise of Kingdoms. Every accessory has a catch. The catch for this one is that there's a diminishing return 
on stats, which means the more of a stat you get, the less benefit you get per point that you gain. And the way that KVK technology works in this game, in the end game, is that you're going to get a bunch of attack and you're going to have a bunch of equipment. And that equipment also is probably going to give you a bunch of attack. So this is another one of those like open field only accessories. And most people just don't pick it. They'd rather just have more war drums because even though the war drums have a very small chance to trigger 10% really low and it only triggers when you're attacking something not when you're getting attacked i think that the issue here is that people would just rather have war drums the cost is the same as the Seth's call and once you get legendary commanders for every single commander you're bringing on the field and those commanders are expertise the rage based effects that you're going to have are so powerful most people just opt for the rage so you will not hear me recommend Seth's call really at any point in this video for any commander from there Here's the item that we'd probably recommend on almost every high damage commander, and that is Ring of Doom. Your attacks have a 10% chance to increase damage up by 50% for two seconds, can trigger up to one time in a five second period. This item is really powerful because not only is it making it so that you do more normal attack damage, and you're doing more counter attack damage, and you're doing more skill damage. During that window of two seconds, you can do really astronomic damage. This is... According to math that I've heard people do, the highest DPS item you can pick, with the exception of certain scenarios, like if you have a Vengeance, you're getting swarmed. From there, let's review the Pendant of Eternal Light, which most people shouldn't make. This thing is really weird. It's 5% skill damage, which sounds cool. But unless you have commanders that do many skill damage effects, then this will actually be outperformed by... Even an epic accessory, which might sound surprising to you, but I found to be true in testing. So Pendant of Eternal Night is really only ideal for combinations of very high skill damage commanders. For example, Guan Yu. Active skill does a lot of skill damage. Fourth skill does a lot of skill damage. You've got Skippy Prime. Active skill does a lot of skill damage. And then he's got other skills that also do skill damage. Those are the situations where Pendant of Eternal Night might actually be high value. And I personally use it on Nebu with Esong in my Canyon lineup because they're doing so much AoE damage and they're hitting lots of targets. So many sources of skill damage is one way to get value from this and lots of AoE damage is the other way. Ideally, both combined together is how you maximize your value with Pendant of Eternal Night. It's also a real pain in the butt to farm from Barbarian Keeps. So technically you could get it free to play, but like this is, a, I think, the, one of the lower priority accessories on my list. Now, from here, we have the epic accessories, and I'll cover these just very briefly. I'll say that Silent Trial is really powerful. Every attack reduces the target's rage by 10. Really good. And I won't get into rage capping here, but suffice to say, the maximum amount of rage you can get per turn is 220. And this is effectively lowering not only the amount of rage you can get per turn, but also the cap. It, it basically subtracts the amount of rage they're going to gain after they've gained all their rage. So for example, if you were going to gain exactly 220 rage, it would drop it down to 210 rage. And even if you were going to go to have gained like 350 rage, the, you get capped down to 220 and then it gets reduced by this 10. So all that to say, rage reduction effects are really powerful. Um, they work really well. I don't know that you want more than one of these in a murder ball necessarily. Last I had looked, these stacked. But then someone came along and told me that they don't now, so I don't know what is true here. But certainly having one floating around is pretty solid, especially at the epic tier. And then Delane's Amulet. What a curiosity. Incoming counterattack damage is reduced. I actually really like this. But uh, one of my kingdom members, and I haven't seen the math, but they're pretty good at math. They determined that you would need to have 15 million troops hit the hospital to offset like the gold cost if you're using T5 or something ridiculous. All that to say, um, the amount of healing cost you're gonna save yourself by having a Delane's Amulet is probably pretty low compared to the gold cost of actually making it or certainly trying to talent it. However, if you're going to be in situations where you're like swarming a garrison, then like, yeah, you really wanna reduce the number of dead troops that you have. And for people that have infinite resources, well, then I guess who cares? Up next is a combat accessory. Wind Scars gives you 8% march speed. I think it's great. 8% march speed is great. Infantry are slow. It's only for infantry, but it is a lot of march speed. I often end up using this on a march like Trajan, which may surprise people. I bring mixed troops, but infantry are the slowest unit 
in that march. So by accelerating the march speed of my infantry specifically, now the whole group is going faster because the infantry were the bottleneck to your speed. You can see this yourself if you put like siege units into a march and then try to run them around, right? You'd go as fast as the slowest unit, which is the siege units. From here, let's talk about ancient stratagems, troop capacity boost. This is really, really good in Canyon, and I don't really like it in the field. The reason I think this is so good in Canyon is that you don't have lots of things increasing your troop capacity. By that, I mean... In the end game, you'll have an expansion increasing your troop capacity. You'll have uh, KVK technology at the end game increasing your troop capacity. This means that in the end game, you're going from like 430,000 troops in a march to like 436,000 troops in a march. Like, yes, having more troops means that your effects that are based off of damage factor do more damage because you have more troops. But like, it's such a small number at that point. I think you're better off with all the other accessories for actually enhancing your damage. So Canyon, where everybody only gets like 100,000 troops base, now it gets really interesting to be able to bring ancient stratagems because the percent troop increase is a lot higher. These other three accessories here are not combat accessories. I'm not going to review those. I'll lastly just review Call of the Loyal, 5% March Speed. I use this on my restart project. You can get a call oil basically for free from Lost Canyon. I like to use it. Um, it is a lot of materials for what you're getting. So maybe prioritize armor over a small amount of march speed. But if you don't have any accessories and you have some decent armor, I think it is really nice to just pick up some extra march speed from Call of the Loyal. Now that we have reviewed what each of these accessories does, let's briefly go over the best accessories for each commander. I'm only going to do the legendaries, otherwise this is going to take forever. And I'm going to just explain very briefly. We're going to start with infantry. For Guan Yu, I really like ring and horn. You want to chain that silence effect as fast as you can from your Guan Yu. So horn cranks out those skill cycles faster. And the ring is just here for pure damage. Some people think you want a lucky coin because of the expertise skill. I will disagree. I think the way that you get your shielding effect to trigger is expertise should come from a commander like Ideally, Skippy Prime or Leonidas. Up next is Richard I. I'm actually using him in Canyon currently, and he's really good there. I'm using the coin purely for tankiness in Canyon. I don't know that that's a good open field choice. In fact, I don't know what accessory I would use here for the open field. Probably a dagger to try to just use him as like a debuffing commander. And, and for the other accessory, I do think that the horn is just really, really strong. You want to fire off the active skill as fast as you can. Keeps your march topped off. Also debuffs a lot of enemies. That's what you want to do. Horn and probably dagger is what I would do on Richard the First. From there, Harold Sigurdsson. Woo, boy. This commander is tricky because the way Stamford Bridge works is really weird. You run the risk of overraging a lot on this commander, but I think horn and ring is probably just the way to go, and I wouldn't overthink it. From there, we're going to talk about a garrison captain. If you're garrisoning with Zenobia in a pass, then I think ring horn is a slam dunk. Horn for the rage, ring for the damage, easy choices. If you're garrisoning a flag, I think you have a lot more options. I've seen Vengeance and Greatest Glory do extremely well. If you're getting swarmed, you actually don't want to use horn because you cap at rage. Remember I said 220 per turn? So when everything is attacking you, you're generating tons of rage. You don't want horn. I think actually greatest glory and vengeance might be the play there, but some number of people will just say, no, you want ring and vengeance. And I think ring vengeance gives you a lot of flexibility because the ring will be really good, even if they're just rallying you for part of it and not swarming. And you can't easily swap out your garrison captain without having a backup captain present. So I think hedging your bets a little bit with the ring rather than a greatest glory is what most people probably do. Skolas' Lucky Coin, as I mentioned before, is kind of interesting as an accessory choice if you are going to be playing in a game mode like uh, Ark of Osiris. And some number of people will probably advocate that you do like Ring and Dagger. I don't really like going with Ring and Dagger. I feel like someone who can just like swarm the rally should be using a Dagger. And the Dagger doesn't scale against all the targets swarming you. The dagger only is affecting the one thing you're hitting. So if you know it's just like a 1v1 and you wanted to like maximize your damage, maybe. I would just stick with horn and ring in most cases. Pakal Herald. 
the most evil march on the face of the world. If you're going to rally something, I think horn and ring is the way to go. If you're going for purely evil um, and you're cheeseburgering, then I think you want to do horn and vengeance. You skill cycle faster and you do tons of counterattack damage. You evil, evil, evil governor. Um, I'm going to make all the same accessory recommendations for Flavius as I made for Zeno. So same thing for Flavius as I recommended for Zeno without having to re-explain it. From there, Skippy, baby. If you're using a Skippy primary, I think Horn Ring is where you want to be. Um, same sort of explanation as Guan. It's just really high damage. Constantine primary in the field is certainly a weird one. If you were to do this, then you'd want to use Horn and you'd want to use probably Dagger. Uh, the reason I like to kind of shove the debuffing accessories for open fielding onto a commander like Constantine is they're not here to do big damage, right? So you want your big damage items on other commanders, your debuffing items on your utility commanders. I consider Constantine utility in this instance. Alexander the Great, Ring Horn, easy choice. Uh, Charles Martel primary, I would go Ring Horn. Depends a lot on who your secondary is, but I'm going to assume it's either Harold or it's going to be Skippy. And either way, Ring and Horn's the way to go. Don't use Leonidas as a primary. I suppose you could use CJ as a primary, and I'm just going to say ring horn, and let's move to cavalry. Nevsky and Attila, man, they're right next to each other in the lineup, so I'm going to cover them both at the same time. The weirdness about Nevsky and Attila, let's first say open field. I really like ring horn. Let's start there. Ring horn, really good for open field. But if you're rallying, and you know they're going to swarm you, you can do really dirty things with vengeance, and even greatest glory, because man... The counterattack damage you deal is just absolutely freaking disgusting. So do I think it's good to overtune your rallies here to prepare you to get swarmed? Um, I don't I don't think so necessarily, but you can do a lot of damage that way. I think Ringhorn is generally the way I would go on those. If you use William Primary, I'm gonna look at you funny, but I'll still recommend I think Ring and Horn here. For garrisoning with Jad, all the same recommendations I gave you for Xeno apply here. Okay, so for a pass, I think you want to use ring horn. For a flag, you can tap in some other things that are anti-swarm. You take the horn off um, and you put on something like vengeance, which is going to work really well if you're getting swarmed, whereas horn is doing you literally no good at all. Um, and if you're in Ark of Osiris, you could consider a lucky coin. From there, oh baby, XY, definitely want ring and horn. Same is true for Saladin, ring horn. Khan, if you're actually using him, ring horn. I don't know why you would use a double C primary. That's super weird. Why are you doing this? For open fielding? No, just stop. Minamoto, uh, ring and horn as well if you had them. No Takeda primaries in the open field, you weirdo. Chandragupta, I don't think that people are using Chandragupta primary. If you did, once again, we're going ring and horn. Okay, from there, Bertrand, birdie. Um, ring and horn is what I'd recommend here as well. With maybe the caveat of like all the same guidance I was giving about using like the Attila Nevsky rally. And I've seen Nevsky Attila done that way. I mean, sure, if you're doing that and you want to stack some counterattack for the anti swarm, you could tap in a vengeance. And I think that's reasonable. One last thing I'll mention for all these cavalry commanders is that somewhere in your murder ball, you're going to want to put that web that I was describing earlier. So what I often end up doing is using the web over here. So I'll do ring for the damage and then the web for the debuffing because I think that debuffing is super important. Theoretically, I mean, a horn would also mean my skills fire faster, which means I do more debuffs. But I think that you get more value overall with this defense reduction over here and just skill cycling without the horn. Okay, Archer Commanders. I think Ring Horn is probably the way to go on Nebu. But as you can see, I've already made this skill damage pendant. So this is where I end up using it. If you're using Ramses, I think Ring Horn is the way to go. Artemisia, Ring Horn is the way to go. This is especially true with Artemisia if you're pairing her with a commander that is going to clear her sort of self-silencing restraint. So Boudicca Prime will make it so that she can't get silenced. Uh, also, Amanatori will make it so that she won't get silenced. In that case, the extra rage is just at all, all upside, baby. It's all upside. Ringhorn on Cyrus the Great. I'd say Ringhorn on Gilgamesh. I already covered Amanatori. If you're garrisoning, all the same guidance is true that I shared with all the other garrison captains. What I will say, though, is that the Amanatori Artemisia garrison is just extremely susceptible to getting swarmed 
And a kingdom that knows what they're doing will make it so it's almost like not viable, in my experience anyways, to use this garrison at all, the Amonitori Artemisia garrison. And the reason is they put a high damage cav rally on there, they own the field, and then they swarm your garrison. And this garrison just cannot handle the 12x swarm. It can't. Not in my experience anyways. Um, so even if you steer the accessories in the direction of making it better against a swarm, I still think it does not well from anything I've seen. Edward of Woodstock? Oh, God. This is weird because you probably are going Edward and Tommy and you're in, like, really early KVKs. Like, do you even have the legendary accessories for this? But, okay. So what would you do here? You probably go with Ring and then maybe you go with one of the debuffing accessories, right? So you could do a Dagger. Dagger would, I think, be pretty reasonable. For Esong, I think Ring and Horn is the way to go. Boudicca Prime, Ring and Horn is the way to go. I don't think anybody does Tommy primary. I don't know why you would do that. So I'm not even going to talk about it. Um, same is sort of true with El Cid. You could do Ring Horn if you wanted. The most I think would be Ring Horn. Henry would be Ring Horn. And if you want to just be evil to people swarming you, then sure. I mean, you swap in like a Vengeance instead of the Horn. And that's, that's scary. Now we review the leadership commanders. This is an interesting one. Because a lot of these, I'm just going to say, why are you using this? And you're just going to have to accept that it's like, Maybe an early game thing, but you're not going to have access to all these accessories in the early game anyways. So I'll just leave it at why are you using this? But Trajan is actually a really interesting one to talk about. So I'm currently using Horn and Dagger. I think it would be really reasonable to use Horn and War Drums. Okay, and the reason I think Horn and War Drums is kind of interesting is that Trajan is just like here to generate rage and boost your skill damage and make the target take more damage, right? You want him to fire off his active skill first because then all your other marches are going to do extra skill damage. So if you really wanted to go all in, I've seen people go Horn, War Drums, and that seems actually reasonable and I'm actually kind of curious to try it myself. But otherwise, using a debuffing item like I've done here, right, like Horn, Dagger, I guess you could do Horn Web, but Trajan's kind of slow. I think that's super reasonable. For your YSS and Theodora, which are primarily just city garrison captains at this point, uh, I think that Ring Horn is really strong if you're dealing with one rally. If you think you're going to get multi-rallied or swarmed, that's where you might consider taking Horn off and putting on something that would help you more in a multi-rally context. Probably not Lucky Coin. Probably not. You could, I guess, uh, because when you're getting hit by like multiple rallies, but not full swarmed, I feel like that's a pretty sweet spot for the coin, but that does just kind of like prolong things. I think if you want to just absolutely wreck them for swarming you or multi-rallying you, that's where like Vengeance Greatest Glory are absolutely wicked. Most people don't have those things. So you probably just end up with whatever you've got, the best of the best. So I guess if my city were to get multi-rallied, like right now, what would I use? Here's the best city garrison that I've got. I, I mean, I, I still use Horn. For the start of it, they're they're not going to be swarming you if you're high enough power. So, eh, that that's what I would do at this exact moment. Horn, ring, and you could consider swapping out that horn for something else. If you think you're getting swarmed and you got something else available. Ethelflaed. Ooh, this is an interesting one. So, Ethelflaed, I'm going to give the same advice as Trajan. This is where you want to put your enablers. Like, Horn Dagger is really interesting. So, you fire off the debuffs on her faster... And then, boom, you're going to, you know, apply that debuff with the dagger. Barca, I mean, this is just all weird stuff, right? Like, early game rallying, I guess you use whatever you have access to, right? But, like, Barca, Caesar, Freddy, um, Mehmed, Ragnar, uh, Charlemagne, <laughs> Suleiman, Moctezuma, Ilubu. Like, these are not commanders that people should really be using. So, I think we just, oh, we just skip all those. And the last curiosity, I guess, is maybe Honda Tadakatsu, who you can use sort of the same recommendation as Edward of Woodstock. If you use him primary, and everyone I know who was has stopped, by the way, then I guess what you want to do is pair him with Tamaris. And in that case, you don't want to generate rage, but you do want to do damage. So I think you use a debuffing item like Dagger or Web, and then you don't want to have rage generating items, but you could use something like ring to boost your damage. Last commander we can talk about, by the way, is Wu Zetian. And for her, the accessories you're going to use, it's the same story as your other city garrison captains for YSS and Theo. I tried to cover a lot of information really quickly in this video, and I get that it may have, it may have been a bit of a whirlwind. My recommendation to you, if you're making your very first legendary accessories in the game, 
are that if you're using multiple marches in the field, dagger and web are your top priorities. Then a horn on like an enabling march, like a Guan Yu or a Trajan are super high value. From there, ring is just really great damage. And in a perfect murder ball, depending on what your philosophy is about war drums, you either want like seven rings and one dagger and one web and like the rest horns, or you want to use maybe instead of some of those horns, you have war drums instead. If we get a look at the balance of my accessories, sort of money where my mouth is here, you can see that a part of the reason I have some accessories that you might not normally make, like for example, this one over here, Pendant of Eternal Light, is like I made this when it was one of the only legendary accessories in the game, right? I made Lucky Coin when this was one of the only legendary accessories in the game. So I have five rings, I have one pendant, I have three horns, a dagger and a web, as I said, and then the lucky coin. And I use all these when I'm open fielding, uh, and I'm going to need to make two more for this upcoming KVK. So subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I'm entering KVK this evening. I'm going to be live streaming it. I'm going to buy every single bundle that has uh, crystals in it or the ability to get me more crystals. So it should be pretty entertaining to watch me power up my tech as much as I possibly can upon entering into KVK. And definitely check out the sponsor of today's video. Link is in the description. If you're looking for more information about equipment, I'll have two other videos you can check out. Cards will appear on screen in just a minute. There'll be one right over here that goes way in depth on accessories. So if you wanted the math behind some of these choices, that will be there for you. And if you're just looking for equipment guides in general for how to get value on equipment and some of your first legendaries, I'll have a card over here explaining that as well.